Yes, yes. Welcome to the ancient world of tabletop games. I am Agamemnon from the historical documentary Time Bandits. This is a report from a fugitive. For over a thousand pages, the role players were the guardians of rules and regulations in the old regime. Before the dark times. Before the fourth edition. Role-playing game Edition Wars. Imagine the turmoil wrought by the replacement of one rulebook with another supposedly fresher rulebook. Do Edition Wars mean much to the players? More purchases? Significantly more admin to go with those purchases? If the new rulebook is significantly different, then old adventure books must be dragged through the upgraded mud to use them with the latest version of the game. Alternatively, you ignore the new rulebook, play the hell out of the old adventures, and then write adventures of your own for a system that is no longer officially supported. Reality sloshes around there somewhere. Catch an online summary of the new rules and hate them? Never mind. You buy the new adventures and rivet old-school statistics onto the troublesome pages. Problem solved. I've covered this before. No rulebook survives contact with the players. You take what you like and make it work. I've altered adventures for entirely different systems and run those in a series with a setting far removed from the adventure book source material. In particular, I'm thinking of 20-odd sessions of the Buffy RPG, a season-length campaign which merged my own written material with adventures from different editions of the Stormbringer slash Elric role-playing games and Gygax Help Me, a couple of cyborg commando adventure modules bought in as a job lot down in the cheap seats, just for use in the otherworldly apocalypse scenes. It all played like a series of Buffy. Edition wars mean a great deal, or nothing at all, depending on the game in question. Why do I use 5th edition Call of Cthulhu if the game is now in its 7th edition? Is there ever a need for a new edition of a game rulebook? You will go to the earlier system. There you will learn from first edition, the rule set which instructed me. In publishing terms, there is always a financially pressing need to generate new content. Aside from that, once a rulebook pops up, there is a financially pressing need for publishers to support that rulebook. This leads to extra rules stored here, there and everywhere in nooks and crannies within published adventures, source books and unearthed tomes. Your basic role-playing rule set is a collection of books flying in loose formation. Everything scattered across adventures and other supplements is eventually gathered into one handy dumping ground, a new edition of the rules. New editions of rulebooks took advantage of feedback from gamers, better printing techniques, more cash floating around the company with which to pay expensive sought-after artists, and so on and new versions of old games simplified or complexified the rules of yesteryear. With games staggering under the weight of their own fictional settings, companies tidied up loose ends in the game lore and sold fresher games to players old and new. Well, that last point comes from an idealized view of the world. We'll gloss over that one for the moment. Don't give in to hate. At the time of recording, Call of Cthulhu is in its seventh edition, and that edition is far different from the preceding six versions of the game. Why do I use this copy, the fifth edition? Convenience? Yes. I don't think I've ever seen a copy of the game's first edition in the wild. There's little to differentiate one edition from another in terms of raw game mechanics and nuts and bolts, right up until seventh edition. Where do our copies of the game rules come from? For arcane reasons, I have two boxes of the game's second edition farmed out to Games Workshop for publication. Those boxes don't contain the rule books, which are clearly things that cannot and should not and must not be. They will surface from the oceans when the stars are right. Games are purchased directly. Other players buy spare copies. Games are bought as gifts. Players leave the hobby and donate copies or sell them. One sneaky wee bastard steals a game at a busy convention stall, runs the length of the hall, dips around a corner, and writes, To name redacted, love from mum, happy birthday, on the stolen copy. Why would this wee shit be carrying a birthday copy of a game to a convention miles away from home? 
especially one that's not farm fresh, but a slightly used second-hand copy. It was long after the event that this snippet emerged. Don't hang around with the known thieves at a convention, folks. You might be caught unsuspecting in that fireball's blast. Where do games come from? From acts of theft, apparently. I don't believe I have any second-hand board games on the shelves. But I have plenty of second- and third-hand role-playing game books here. Though I ran games of Dungeons & Dragons, I didn't own any copies of the rules until I bought a set of third-edition books cheaply off the internet, and those were purchased for this channel. If I wanted to run the world's largest dungeon again, the easiest approach was to use the third-edition D&D rules. Though I could use the third edition as source material for videos about the game's evolution. This second-hand edition of the player's handbook came with its own player handout, a piece of paper inside with a dungeoneering kitty noting twenty gold pieces, obviously from a high-stakes game. What's that? You played D&D &D and elected a player the party treasurer, and you thought you were the only one with that experience? That monster manual has club written inside. I suspect that's gaming club details and nothing relating to the use of a cudgel. Though I wouldn't be surprised if that turned out to be the case. We come to the business of the other players. You buy a game. Maybe you really take to it or you don't. If you take to it, it is your game. No one else buys a copy. Why not? Players prefer surprises. They don't want to know the names, statistics, abilities, strengths and weaknesses of the game's monsters, for one thing. To give you a break from running your game, one player offers to run it so that you can experience play on the other side of the Game Master's screen. I won't tire of saying this. The Game Master is also a player. So this other player borrows your copy of the game. Still, no one else spies the rules. Unless... You are playing the hell out of a game that has tons of reference material in the rules. Then another player purchases a copy to help speed up character creation or make equipment purchasing go by more rapidly. Two spellcasters don't butt heads over finding spell descriptions if multiple copies of the rules are bandied about the table. The one thing that doesn't fly around the gaming table is a different set of the rules. There's one addition to rule them all, and in the dungeon, find them. We haven't seen much in the way of addition wars for Call of Cthulhu. Dungeons and Dragons, though, has a different history. Oh, go on then. Give in to hate. If you choose to play 4th edition, you will face it alone. I cannot interfere. Cthulhu was, and is, my game. I took to it, and the other players let me claim it. On occasion, someone else ran a game just to let me experience the futility of trying to investigate anything in the company of a bunch of players who were thrown together in one room just to make the Muppets look like Sherlock Holmes, Miss Marple, May Gray, Sam Spade, Philip Marlowe, and Poirot combined. Hashtag big fun. The world's most famous RPG is Dungeons & Dragons. Thinking really hard about this one, D&D &D would have been... Possibly. The seventh RPG I played out of countless systems. A taxed memory puts Cthulhu in there around the eighth game system I tried. The first full RPG I bought, also the second one I'd have written adventures for after Tunnels and Trolls. However you slice the history, Cthulhu was my game. No one else bought a copy of it for ages. The other players were new to the setting and they didn't want to know all the secrets. See my video on the Game Master's screen for an example of players who knew too much about a game versus players who knew next to nothing and created their own brand of fun. Players come and go. I had a battered copy of Cthulhu to get by on. A player turned up with what was a birthday gift, if I recall. Another Games Workshop copy of the game in the third edition. I drained that copy of the game into my memory and saw that the book wasn't too far removed from the copy we used. As I was free to borrow the third edition, no one got around to buying it. This was true of the fourth edition. That copy wasn't fundamentally different in terms of rules. The third edition was easy enough to use for adventures published during the fourth edition era. A brief word on eras. The Cthulhu rules went through new editions at very short intervals, often only three years apart. This fifth edition was the first copy of the rules to go through two revisions, 
both still called fifth, extending its lifespan. I think little of rule books that carry decimal points to them. One player sacrificed good coin on the altar of third edition D&D. That game was nearly not quite replaced by a new edition of the rules known as 3.5, the cash grab. Pardon my cynicism. As for fourth edition Cthulhu, another player belatedly picked up a copy, but we made do with the third edition whether that player was around or not. Why? With few changes in the rules, there was no such thing as an edition war. The publisher didn't fight for the hearts and minds and wallets of the target audience. Instead, the publisher kept it simple. You could take any edition of the game from first through to fourth and run any published adventure, no matter which edition the adventure was written under. Compatibility was practically guaranteed. We knew this and referenced the third edition rules. Finally, this fifth edition emerged. Looking it over in a shop, I determined it was time to upgrade to a rulebook that was, let's face it, just as compatible with older adventures as the previous four editions had been. Loads of little rules and all those spells from adventure books now sloshed around in a consolidated tome. The fifth edition was finally worth upgrading to. With seven editions out, why don't I have the sixth or seventh editions? Before I could buy the sixth edition, another player jumped the gun and bought it. I drained that version and deposited the knowledge in my memory vaults. The sixth edition wasn't that far removed from the fifth one. I stuck with the fifth edition for convenience. Adventures were just as compatible as before. Here's a game in six editions, and you can run the earliest Cthulhu adventures with any of those rulebooks. Later, I considered upgrading to the sixth edition, but for the asking price, it felt like the same rulebook with a bigger price tag. You have to investigate more than a few blasted heaths online to find the fifth edition at a reasonable cost now. The sixth edition has uncannily shot up in price since. And the seventh edition? Finally, an edition war of sorts. The rules changed significantly. There is compatibility going back the way, but you have to work at it a bit. That's never truly an issue. You always have to work at rules and adventures to make them flow. What of publishing companies? It's easy, for reasons of profit, to go in the other direction, release classic adventures in the new format for the latest edition of the game, with updated art and design accompanying the shift in rules. We see that approach in a few Cthulhu publications, and it's certainly there in Dungeons & Dragons. Edition Wars in D&D, you ask? How much time have you got? D&D leaps from its origins to third edition. That's quite a jump, a major leap in changes to the core game mechanisms by third edition. Time to revisit that point. With games staggering under the weight of their own fictional settings, companies tidied up loose ends in the game lore and sold fresher games to players old and new. Well, that last point comes from an idealised view of the world. Now's the time to give in to hate. Games can lose the original audience with a change in edition. At fault are two major alterations. First, if the game lore, the setting, is thrown on the rubbish heap and abandoned in favour of something that is no longer the game, regardless of improvements, that new edition is fly spray and the paying customers are treated as the flies. Second, if the game system changes radically, Regardless of improvements, that new edition is a grenade and the publisher is blamed for removing the pin some time ago. Combining setting and system alterations doesn't add to the publisher's woes, it multiplies them. There are people who can play all the versions of D&D with a little work up until the third edition. And there are people who do not admit that fourth edition D&D, the Windows Vista of the RPG world, even exists. My progression through D&D went as far as 3rd edition. We roundly mocked the release of a 3.5 edition of the rules, and the various 5 point somethings of the Cthulhu 5th edition blithely passed us by. When I checked the 4th edition D&D rules online, I saw the game transformed into a simulation of the computer game World of Warcraft. Irony, given that World of Warcraft was itself turned into an RPG using the 3rd edition D&D rules as a source of inspiration. Your players were seduced by the dark side of the publisher. They ceased to be 3rd edition fans and became daft players. When that happened, the 3rd edition character sheet was destroyed. So what I told you was true, from a certain point of view. 
Here's 5th edition D&D. It's a streamlined version of the earlier game aimed at a mass market. Injecting new players into the hobby is always difficult. The existence of this version of the game is welcomed, even if the cost isn't. How different is 5th edition? The rules are still split across three books. You could do a fair bit of work on compatibility across different editions just to play an old adventure with the new rules. The new adventures hark back to those earlier dungeons, though, so that's always an alternative. Some things remain constant in D&D, aiding compatibility. The monsters keep their names, as do the magic items. Those ogres of giant boots in 2nd edition Advanced Dungeons and Dragons might use different rules, but players in a 3rd edition of the game can still wear them and know roughly what to expect. And that is a role-playing fact. This video is far too short to cover edition wars in anything approaching depth. The topic of clones is a video series unto itself. Lo, it came to pass that there was a split in the Church of Gygax. With the land of Canaan rent asunder, the new flock turned to the graven image of 4th edition, and there was much weeping and gnashing of teeth from the dispossessed, who turned from the false idol and prepared for the second coming, the arrival of Pathfinder. Company bankruptcy factors into new rules for old games. Fire, flood, earthquake, theft, you name it, it's had an effect on RPG history. Let's have the golden rule. It is possible to run any adventure from the history of the RPG world, regardless of system or edition. All you consider is the amount of work you are willing to put into the project. Take the Pulp Cthulhu setting as an example. When I checked out the 7th edition rules changes online, I was struck by the similarity to the second edition of an espionage game called Top Secret, a game that itself is now in its third edition. Here's the first edition of Top Secret, bought in especially for this channel, and there's the second edition. Here's the Pulp Action Adventure sourcebook for Top Secret. My plan is to use the pulp setting from Top Secret Agent 13 as a jumping off point for a pulpier style of Cthulhu game. These 7th edition Cthulhu products will work just fine with the 2nd edition rules for an entirely different game and setting. No rulebook survives contact with the players. There's no need to rupture your intestines over RPG rulebook edition wars. These are books. We make them compatible with a little work, or a lot of effort. I remember being at a convention with a newly purchased rulebook to hand. A drive-by gamer shouted his opinion at me across the crowded hall. Crap game. My response? Great game. We were both right, of course. And we didn't expend any more energy on it than that lightning-quick exchange. Play games straight out of the box with the rules as written. Or bring your Frankensteinian experiment to life on the slab of the gaming table from the dubious safety of that cardboard blast shield, the Game Master's screen. Have fun. And to those gamers of mine who played through that Buffy series, yes, those were Cyborg Commando adventures. Cyborg Commando really was a crap game. The hijacked adventures worked well as post-apocalyptic Buffy scenarios. Be mock-shocked after the event. If it's sitting there unused, I'll find a use for that RPG book by converting it into anything except toilet paper. For that purpose, the quality is no good. But for gaming, give anything a shot. It's all compatible, if you make it so.